The next item of business is a debate on motion number 11567 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on lowering the drink drive limit. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Mr McCaskill to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes please. <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, members will be aware that the Scottish Government has long argued uh, that a lower drink drive limit will save lives and help make Scotland's roads safer. In addition, some members in this chamber have also long campaigned on this important issue. In particular, I would like to pay uh, tribute uh, to Dave Thompson, who has been a tireless campaigner for a lower drink drive limit and first raised the matter in Parliament way back in October 2007. Earlier this month, uh, we saw the 50th anniversary of the first anti-drink drive television adverts in the UK. The existing drink drive limit was introduced in 1967. Social attitudes towards drink driving were very different when it was first introduced. And I think it's fair to say that back then, hard as it may now be to believe, many people really did not think that it was irresponsible or dangerous to get behind the wheel of a car after having been drinking. Since then, attitudes toward drink drivers have hardened considerably and understandably. A survey of UK drivers published earlier this month found that 91% agreed drink driving was unacceptable. And 92% of people said they would feel ashamed if they were caught drinking and driving. This compares to over half of male drivers and nearly two thirds of young male drivers who admitted drink driving on a weekly basis in 1979. However, the sad truth is that there remain a persistent minority who, despite repeated warnings, put their lives and the lives of others at risk by getting behind the wheel after drinking alcohol. In 2012-13, 4,730 people were convicted of drink and drug driving offences in Scotland's courts. Now, that may be a dramatic fall when compared to the 8,145 people convicted of those offences in 2003-2004. But too many people are still choosing to ignore the warnings and drink and drive. The consequences of drink driving can be tragic. Drink driving costs lives. That is why it's right that we take action to reduce the risk on our roads. Last month, reported Road Casualties Scotland 2013 was published. The report revealed 580 casualties were estimated to be due to drink drive accidents in Scotland in 2012. Around 10 fatalities were estimated to be due to drink drive accidents in Scotland in 2012. A fall in 2011 figures, but for the average for the last four years remains at 20 fatalities. Casualties resulting from drink drive accidents fell by over 50% since 2007, uh, from 1,270 to 580. In 2013, 2.4% of drivers involved in injury accidents who were asked for a breath test registered a positive reading or refused to take the test. So while we welcome the reduction in the number of casualties, these figures still show that over the last four years, an estimated one in 10 deaths on Scotland's roads involves drivers with a blood alcohol reading which is above the current limit. That is 20 deaths each year with another 560 suffering injury, 100 of those being seriously injured. I know that some have said that our efforts should concentrate on enforcing the existing limit more strictly and that there's no need to reduce the drink drive limit. Well, let me be clear that this ignores the scientific evidence that the risks of driving under the influence of alcohol start to increase well below the current legal limit. Indeed, there's now a wealth of research indicating 
that the impairment begins with any departure from zero blood alcohol concentration. With a blood alcohol level of between 50 and 80 micrograms, vision is affected, slowing reactions to red lights and tail lights. Drivers are more likely to drive too fast and to misjudge distances when approaching bends. Motorcyclists will find it difficult to drive in a straight line. BME evidence shows that the relative risk of being involved in a road traffic crash for drivers with a reading of 80 per 100 millilitres of blood was 10 times higher than for drivers with a zero blood alcohol reading. The relative crash risks for drivers with a reading of 50 milligrams of alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood was more than twice the level for drivers with a zero blood alcohol reading. The independent review of drink and drug driving law conducted by Sir Peter North in 2010 concluded that reducing the drink drive limit from 80 milligrams to 50 milligrams will save lives. The current drink drive limit has had its day. If we look at the drink driving limits across Europe, it's only the UK and Malta which have a legal blood alcohol limit of 80 milligrams of alcohol in every 100 millilitres of blood. Reducing the limit to a lower level of 50 milligrams of alcohol per 100 millilitres to bring Scotland into line with most other European countries is the right approach and will make Scotland's roads safer. I first raised the matter of the drink drive limit with the UK government back in 2008. And it is a real shame that it's taken until now to reach the position where we're able to reduce the drink drive limit to make Scotland's roads safer. The Scotland Act 2012 devolved the power to set the drink drive limit. We welcome the fact that we have this power to make Scotland's roads safer through a lower limit. However, we consider this very limited transfer of power was a missed opportunity. We wanted a package of powers that would allow the police to carry out breath testing of drivers anytime, anywhere. We also called for powers to consider differential limits, for example, for young and novice drivers and the ability to change the penalties for drink driving. However, these were not granted by the UK government. It is right that this parliament should have the powers to set appropriate and proportionate penalties for drink driving. I welcome Margaret Mitchell's amendment, which seeks this parliament's views on drink driving penalties, which I presume she supports the call for such powers to be granted to this parliament. We are clear that the current automatic 12 month driving ban is appropriate at the current limit and will remain appropriate at the lower limit. There is strong evidence that drivers with a blood alcohol reading between 50 and 80 micrograms are significantly impaired and an automatic ban is appropriate to deter people from drinking and driving. We will continue to argue for greater powers to tackle drink driving. The Scottish Government's submission to the Smith Commission makes a case that giving this Parliament full responsibility for the law on road traffic offences will help to tackle drink driving, making Scotland's roads safer and address the current anomalies in the boundaries between reserved and devolved areas. We want the lower drink drive limit to result in less drink driving, not more convicted drivers. To ensure that drivers are aware that the lower limit is coming into effect, the Scottish Government yesterday launched a public information campaign which is aimed at informing all adults of driving age in Scotland. This campaign comprises advertising and television, video on demand and radio, partnership and stakeholder engagement, fueled marketing, website updates, social media and PR, and includes materials relating to the effects of alcohol the morning after a night out. However, in finishing, let me be clear that whatever the limit may be, it should not be forgotten that alcohol at any level impairs driving and our central message remains, don't drink and drive. I therefore move the motion in my name. I'm happy to accept the amendments uh, from both uh, Labour and Tory on the basis that we're not seeking to reduce the current period of disqualification for the reduction to 50, but would welcome the opportunity to consider what further powers may be available, what further action could be taken if we had control over penalties. 
Thank you very much. I now call on Graham Pearson to speak to and move Amendment 11567.1. Mr Pearson, you have seven minutes, a generous seven minutes, should you wish. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, let me state from the outset that uh, Scottish Labour supports the Government's motion uh, and I raise to offer an amendment from Scottish Labour. Uh, there is no reservation about our support for the Government's intentions in this matter. It's the right thing to do, it's the right time to do it, and we hope that if implemented at the end of our, our debate, that such a change, which we anticipate, will bring about a greater level of safety on Scottish roads and protect the citizens of Scotland eh, across the, the whole of our country. Eh, the Cabinet Secretary has been good enough to rehearse the statistics for us, and they are maddening in the fact that it does not need to be that way. There will be very few people in this chamber eh, and who will listen to this debate whose families have not been touched by an incident in which a person under the influence of drink, and not as we sometimes imagine a drunk driver, but someone whose abilities have been impaired through alcohol, has caused an accident, has created enormous angst, injury, and sometimes, unfortunately, death. In 2010, Sir Peter North, eh, commissioned by the Labour Party in UK, it reviewed all the circumstances and recommended that the blood alcohol content should be reduced to 50 milligrams. He indicated that thereby, in his estimation, up to 168 deaths would be saved across the United Kingdom in the first year of implementation. It is with some uh, depression that we note that the UK Government refused to accept Sir Peter North's recommendations. And that, as the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged, was a real missed opportunity, uh, and one that one would hope the UK would revisit uh, sooner rather than later. Today is a bit like the banning and smoking. Uh, Mr McCaskill was quite right. In the 60s and 70s, the notion of, particularly men, I've got to say, getting behind the wheel of a motor car whilst impaired and in those days often drunk eh, behind a wheel was accepted as part of the culture of the time. Eh, there was machismo involved and everybody had the ability to make a judgment on whether or not they were fit for the purpose of driving. With the introduction of the alchemeters and the breath tests, that has changed. But I think we need to acknowledge that even as adults in a modern Scotland, we became involved in all sorts of debates and arguments about the fairness of the administration of the uh, technologies to detect people who were impaired. And we made it a very difficult task to produce people within our police offices to uh, obtain the evidence that was necessary for prosecution. I'm pleased that much of that is now behind us and that we realise this is a public safety issue. It's not an issue about criminalising uh, members of our community. I would note, because I anticipate there won't be much antagonism uh, this afternoon in this debate, I would anticipate that all in the chamber today support the government's intentions. But I did some research before coming to the chamber uh, in, in relation to how these changes affect various communities. It should be noted that in Ireland, in the southwest of Ireland, when it was indicated that they would reduce the, the standard from 80 milligrams per 100 litres to 50 milligrams per 100 metres, uh, in Kerry, the council moved that there should be an amendment to the intention which would allow the Gardaí to issue permits to local members of the community who were trusted and respected members to enable them to drive with uh, amounts of alcohol beyond the 50 milligrams. And it was debated with some strength and proposed to the Justice Secretary in Dublin. I'm pleased to say that no further steps were taken in that regard and no decision was offered. It merely fell by the wayside through lack of support. But it does indicate the concerns that exist within rural communities about the impacts that occur in relation to these changes. And we should acknowledge it. 
and hence the, the amendment that uh, I propose today, which ensures an educational and media campaign as part of the main government motion. It will be important that we further educate the community. If we tell the community 10 times, we need to do it 10 times more and 10 times more. Only when they are personally involved by the outcomes from incidents involving drivers under the influence of alcohol do people take these things seriously. And we need to get it into the minds of people such as me. These are not evil people. These are careless people who don't think ahead of time. There's a duty on the government and on this parliament to bring to their attentions now the impacts of what could happen, particularly over the festive period. Uh, and, of course I would. Thank David you. Stewart. Does the member share my view that we should introduce a graduated driving licence scheme for young drivers? And the member will know the proposals are that there's no alcohol during that training period until they have a full unrestricted licence. Uh, on, a, on, a personal on a personal basis, I think that the member makes a very important point and one that I would support. Although I've got to tell him that I was at Stranraer Academy only yesterday, and out of the blue that very issue was raised. And the, the young person concerned thought it was very unfair that we would treat young drivers any differently from mature drivers uh, such as me. Uh, although I did raise the fact that statistically young drivers are more likely to be involved in road accidents in any case, with or without the impairment of alcohol. So in bringing uh, my contribution to a close, I hope that the government do invest the necessary financial support to ensure an educational media campaign is launched. I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to examine the possibility of the modern-day alchemeters being provided in some form to the general public so that they can understand the impact of alcohol that they consume. I have no knowledge of the costs of such things and whether it would be a practical solution, but uh, I trust that as the debate progresses, this Parliament, as one, agrees that the motion and the amendment from the Labour Party is supported and subject to the contribution from the Conservative Party will take a judgment on their amendment through the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you. And I now call on Margaret Mitchell to speak to and move Amendment 11567.2. Margaret Mitchell, you have five minutes or thereby. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives support initiatives to make Scotland's roads safer. The pain, heartache and devastation the families and the victims of drunk drivers suffer is frankly unimaginable. The new 50 gram limit therefore represents an important measure to try and ensure no family has to endure this experience. However, last week it was reported that no fewer than 10,000 officers will be responsible for a drink driving crackdown over the festive season. At the same time that these officers are being tasked to pull over vast numbers of people for random spot checks, we know, depressingly, crimes such as domestic abuse will escalate. So it's essential that in seeking to legitimately prioritise manpower to crack down and drink driving over Christmas and New Year, this deployment is proportionate. This means ensuring sufficient police officers are available to police housebreak-ins, thefts, serious and sexual assaults and incidents of domestic abuse. For since its inception, Police Scotland has attracted justified criticism as the culture of target setting has been exposed. Only a few months ago, concerns about the implementation of Police Scotland's stop and search policy were well aired in this chamber. And the targeting of speeding in general and in certain areas specifically has attracted adverse headlines. So while the Chief Constable states that rank-and-file officers do not have numerical target placed on them, the SPA and HMICS have both published reports in May and July this year, which point highlight... Point of order, um, forgive me, Ms Mitchell, a point of order from Sandra White. A point of order, President Officer. Could um, Margaret Mitchell please mention the actual motion and amendment that she's speaking to? I haven't heard anything about it at all. Uh, thank you for that request for a point of order, but it's not a point of order. It's a matter for Margaret Mitchell, the word she chooses to 
And I suggest Sandra uh, White listens carefully. She's obviously lost a thread of the, um, of the argument here. This year, which highlighted perceived pressures on police officers not just to meet but to exceed targets as part of the appraisal process. In a minute, if you don't mind, I just want to complete this point. The SPA report identified evidence of officers perceived pressure to conduct searches. Meanwhile, HMICS report, report found evidence of detailed processes do exist across Scotland to monitor individual officers' productivity and their personal contribution to KPIs and targets. Consequently, it is important to stress that lowering the drink drive limit should not and must not become about providing an opportunity for Police Scotland to fill quarters or to meet targets. I'll give way to Elaine Murray. Dr Murray. Thank the member for that. Uh, I just wondered if you could clarify the intention of your amendment because the way I read it suggested that actually that the application of penalties involved for the drink driving limit should be proportionate, which almost could suggest that actually you should take a more lenient view on those people who are between the 50 and 80. Now, obviously, I think we would have difficulties in supporting that if that is the intention of the amendment. I'll come to Margaret that point Mitchell. specifically if you allow me to develop my argument. Um, furthermore, the Cabinet Secretary and today's motion, in fact, emphasised that the new drink driving limit brings Scotland into line with most of Europe. Despite this, during the consultation phase and the Justice Committee evidence sessions, the Scottish Government has failed to make clear that while penalties for drink driving in Europe vary widely, they tend to be less severe than those in the UK. In France, for example, the penalties for a driver with a BAC of between 50 milligrams and 80 milligrams usually consists of a fine with stiffer penalties for drivers who are well over the limit, including a more substantial fine and a licence suspension of up up to two, uh, three years. In the UK, the penalties for driving or attempting to drive while above the legal limit, currently 80 grams, are set by Westminster. They include six months imprisonment, up to £5,000 fine and or a driving ban for at least one year. These penalties are stiff and I therefore welcome the Labour amendment calling for an accompanying education and media campaign to cover the morning after effects of alcohol. This should should help to ensure an otherwise law-abiding individual does not unwittingly find themselves just marginally over the new legal limit and criminalised with a potentially far-reaching adverse impact on their livelihoods. The SNP has um, made it quite clear that they think the drink driving penalty should be devolved to Holyrood. At the same time, as recently as last week, no attempt had been made to work with or even consult Westminster justice ministers about this important issue. The result, bizarrely, means that drivers who live in England, travelling in Scotland, who are over the 50 gram but under the 80 gram limit, potentially face severe penalties for a crime that has no statutory basis out of the border. Presiding officer, the amendment in my name seeks to achieve two things. Firstly, given past events, it calls on Police Scotland to enforce new drink drive limits proportionately rather than a target setting exercise. And secondly, it encourages debate about the application of penalties for drink driving in Scotland. To date, it's evident the SNP government has not fully thought through the full implications of a measure which, if properly and proportionately implemented, has the potential to prevent the misery which can result from drink driving to save lives. I move the amendment my name. Thank you very much. And we now move to open debate and I call on Dave Thompson to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Four minute speeches with time for interventions. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I am delighted to be taking part in the debate today. As I have, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, been campaigning since I entered this Parliament in 2007 to have the drink driving limit reduced from 80 milligrams of alcohol per 100 ml of blood to 50 milligrams. Indeed, after a chat with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in 2007, I wrote asking him to take action on this matter. I then took part in several debates on the issue, the first in October 2007, and a further two in 2008, and also hosted a number of events in the Parliament. It soon became clear that there was overwhelming support in this Parliament to reduce the drink driving limit. Indeed, one vote was unanimous. But we had no power to do anything about it at that time. 
After these debates, I continually pressed the matter with the UK Government, who eventually agreed to devolve the issue via the Scotland Act 2012. This was rapidly followed by the Scottish Government announcing in March 2013 their intention to reduce the limit following consultation. This rapid action by the Scottish Government was music to my ears and contrasts markedly with the typical prevarication of Westminster. Getting a reduction in the drink driving limit in Scotland has not been easy because of the UK government's position. And many lives, I believe, have been lost or blighted because of the delays caused by them. As far back as 1997 and again in 1998, the UK government said they intended to reduce the limit by 50 milligrams, 250 milligrams. But in March 2000, they then announced they had decided not to lower the limit because of possible moves to harmonise drink driving limits in the European Union. In January 2001, the EU did indeed adopt a recommendation proposing harmonisation of the drink driving limit at 50 milligrams or below. But the UK government, true to form, announced that it had no plans to reduce the limit as the recommendation was not binding on member states. The UK government continued to procrastinate until in the second review of the road safety strategy published in February 2007, they said they would keep the case for a reduction in the blood alcohol limit under review. Then again in June 2007, they said they were once more in favour of a 50 milligram limit, but first wanted to see evidence of enforcement of the current 80 milligram limit by the police before they would publish a consultation paper later in the year to gauge public opinion. That consultation paper never appeared, and so the prevarication continued, and more lives were lost. Subsequently, I chased them up in January 2008, and again in April 2008, when I was told that they were pressing ahead with the consultation and that they would give careful consideration to the views of interested parties in Scotland. I continued to press the matter with the support of the Scottish Government and eventually in 2010 the UK Government agreed to devolve the issue. Undoubtedly, as a result of this law, there will be fewer accidents and lives lost in Scotland. And it is to my regret that a similar reduction is not applying in the rest of the UK to also cut the loss of lives. Every life is precious, and as the new law results in lives being saved, this can only be a good thing. It is significant that the Scottish Government, once it had power, acted so quickly, unlike Westminster, where the limit is still 80 milligrams, unlike every European country bar Malta. We are fortunate we have a Scottish Government that is not in the hip pocket of the big booze companies, and therefore has no conflict of interest when enacting legislation for the good of the people of Scotland. And long may that continue. In closing, uh, Presiding Officer, my position on would. drink driving is this. If you are driving, then don't drink. And if you are drinking, then don't drive. Many thanks. Now call on Dr Richard Simpson to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Deputy Presiding. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and voice my support for the lowering of the drink driving limit. Uh, Sir Peter North's uh, report, I think, indicated that this was a, a highly appropriate thing to do and the public clearly support it. Driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs endangers themselves and our community. And we should focus on refreshing the practical steps that can be taken to deal with this problem and the penalties imposed upon people need to be effective, acting as both adequate punishment and a deterrent against future drink and driving, drug and driving, and should safeguard the public from the dangers of such activity. In addition, any, any changes uh, made, to limit, uh, made to the limit must be accompanied by a complementary public awareness campaign, which Labour propose. Across the UK, there are about 430 deaths and I believe about 16,000 injuries due to drink uh, and, and driving, but also uh, associated drunk, uh, drug driving each year. 
and with a proportional amount of those occurring here in Scotland. There is strong public support for lowering the drink driving limit. Estimates show that up to 17 lives and many injuries could be saved annually in Scotland by reducing the limit to 50 milligrams per 100 mils and the standard of most EU countries. There are those who would argue for even an, a lower level, but this proposal is a welcome step, as I say, supported by the public. I'd like to uh, invite the Minister to address a few issues relating to testing and sentencing of, in relation to drink driving. Is it correct that the police have unlimited power to stop cars, but may only proceed to a breathalyzer test if they suspect that the driver has been drinking? And would he want to change that? The North report asserts that breathalyzers have now become much more accurate and thus the statutory option for blood and urine testing is no longer required. The proposal for a breathalyzer test level is now, I believe, 25 mcg. Is this indeed the trigger level to be adopted? Under the previous rules, there was flexibility given up to 40 mcg. What will the new guidance be? How long will it take to recalibrate the current testing equipment to the new standards? Because if we don't get that right, there are lawyers who will actually, quite rightly, act to protect their clients. Can the Cabinet Secretary guarantee that matters of this sort are fully in hand before introducing the new measure? Yes? I thank the member to give the intervention. I think regarding the recap Rebrating of the breath testing that had happened last year and I think that was very important because of course it's reserved and one of the powers will be great to have devolved the, to having the, the recalibrating of uh, our breath test uh, breath test uh, be, be, being, being devolved will, will be a, a, a great improvement in the future if, if the member would agree I'm in favour of this area being devolved in a very appropriate way so that we can cover all aspects of it because we already cover some of them, so I would welcome that. Um, could I ask if our Scottish courts have the power to order a permanent removal of licence after the second offence? Because, again, it seems to me that if there's been a second offence, that we should have that power. What is the current sentencing guidelines for anyone caught driving after their licence has been suspended due to drink driving? Additionally, driving whilst impaired by both drugs and alcohol is a growing problem in the United Kingdom as a whole, and I wonder what the Scottish Government's view is on this issue. Uh, finally, I hope that the Government will support the part of my bill to ensure that GPs are notified of offences like drink driving, especially where it involved the custodial events. I was never informed in all my 30-plus years as a GP that such an offence had been committed. This and control over caffeinated alcohol mix, which can lead to people believing that they are more competent than they are in reality, I think that it's important that we limit the caffeine levels in caffeine alcohol mixes, and I hope the government will support my, the part of my bill that deals with this. Uh, we must use the powers we already have Though I do personally, as I've indicated, support more powers for us to differentiate levels, such as those indicated by David Stewart in relation to novice drivers. So in conclusion, close, Presiding please. Officer, I'm very disappointed the UK coalition has backed off on this matter. Its record is poor on this as it is on nutrition to tackle the obesity. The Scottish Government will have our, our government on backing all reasonable measures to improve public health. And I support the motion and welcome the Cabinet Secretary's support for Labour's amendment. Thank you so much. I now call on Sandra White to be followed by Alison McInnes. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also commend Dave Thompson for his tenacity and the work that he's carried out in the years uh, to bring this to fruition? So thank you very much, Dave, uh, in that respect. Uh, President Officer, as I've mentioned before, that things others have, the majority of people in Scotland support a lower drink limit as it's obviously evidence in the consultation which is carried out by the Scottish Government. 
An independent analysis of those who responded to the consultation found that 74% believe that drink drive limits should be reduced and 87% of those agreed that the blood alcohol limit should be reduced to 50 mils stroke 100 mils, milligrams 100 mils. Now, the British Medical Association of Scotland and the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents all support a reduction in the drink drive limit. And we have to ask why, <laughs> because it will save lives, as they have said, and others also. And importantly, and very importantly, discourage drivers not to drink and drive. And that's where the educational aspect will come in also. Now, I know figures have been bandied about. I'd just like to put a few of my own. An average of 20 lives a year are lost through drink driving. Last year, 90 people were seriously injured, 340 slightly injured as a result of drink driving. And really, this is totally unacceptable, and it really does affect all that are involved. And I would just like to mention the comments from Paul Bassett, General Manager of South East Division Scottish Ambulance Service. And he says, all too often, our ambulance crews have to deal with the tragic consequences of drink driving, which have a devastating impact on families and communities, also the ambulance drivers and the rescue workers also. Uh, the message is clear, he says, and we hope that this initiative will reduce the number of lives that are ruined as a result of drink driving. Now, presiding officer, no one should be drinking and driving, uh, and drivers should be taking full responsibility for their actions. Uh, Kathleen Braidwood from the Road Safety Officer at Rospa also mentions the fact that people need to realise that any amount of alcohol impairs a driver's ability to judge speed and distance well behind the wheel. Alcohol also slows reaction times and can make drivers overconfident, as already been mentioned, and more likely to take risks. Lowering the drink driving limit will not only contribute to making our roads safer, but also have a wider social impact. And I think that's very important, as I said at the beginning, affects all aspects of lives as well. Now, there's been issues raised, um, Graham Pearson mentioned the fact about, you know, education, uh, media, that type of thing also. Now, the measures that uh, the CABSEC has brought out to the general public to make them aware, I think he's covered most of uh, the measures we are looking at and they've been very, very well outlined. And when you look at the TV, radio, electronic sides, both here and on the borders, at petrol stations, uh, pubs, retail organisations, I think it's been looked at absolutely very, very carefully. And I doubt if anyone uh, wouldn't be aware of the changes which are going to take place. And it is incumbent on drivers and others to ensure that they know what the law is. Uh, basically, I don't want to raise the issue that uh, Margaret Mitchell raised uh, earlier on. I didn't quite understand, Margaret, where you were coming from, as I don't think a number of us did. So perhaps in summing up, we could have more of an explanation in regards to that. Uh, the Scottish Government did ask for more powers for penalties and changes in that in 2012, as Dave Thompson had mentioned when we had the powers brought forward about reducing the drink driving licence. So uh, the Westminster Government was asked, but did not come forward with it. And I think we'd all agree agree, as uh, Richard Simpson said, also these powers, it would be welcome to have it here in the Scottish Parliament to work in tandem with some of the other ideas. Also, drink driving bright, blights lives for everyone, and we have to do our utmost to ensure that, yes, as, as Graham Pearson said, perhaps the people George, aren't criminals, please. not to criminalise them, but educate them to the fact that drink driving will not be acceptable uh, from now on in Scotland. Thank you. Thanks. I now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Christian Allard. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The current drink drive limit was set in 1965. Since then, I'm glad to say perceptions have changed. Public and scientific understanding of the risks has increased dramatically. However, for many folk, there is still some confusion as to what the existing limit allows. A pint, a glass of wine, what constitutes a unit, and how many can you have and still legally drive? In future... The message couldn't be clearer. If you have had even one drink, you should not drive. And the evidence for that is irrefutable. Drinking even a small amount deteriorates drivers' reaction times, concentration and motoring skills. It can instill false confidence, impair coordination and weaken the judgment of factors including distance and speed. As we've heard, the number of drink driving accidents and casualties have halved in recent years. However, the latest Transport Scotland data shows there were still 440 drink drive accidents in 2012, causing 580 people to be injured, and amongst that, 10 fatalities. 
A 2010 study by the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence found drivers intoxicated to the existing limit of 80 milligrams were 11 times more likely to be involved in a fatal car crash than drivers who had no alcohol in their blood. Reduced to 50 milligrams, this falls to three times as likely. In short, drinking at all increases the chance of a collision. Why not adopt a zero tolerance approach then? Ideally, no one with alcohol in their system would get behind the wheel, but we understand that this would appear to cause practical and technical difficulties. A study by University College London estimates reducing the limit to 50 milligrams would still prevent 65 deaths and 250 serious injuries each year if adopted across the UK. And the evidence from Ireland is that it will encourage a culture change that will deliver year-on-year -year improvements, which in itself is a great step forward. And I hope that the rest of the United Kingdom will, will follow Scotland's lead on this. I, I cannot support the Conservative amendment today. I'm afraid Margaret Mitchell didn't set out a co coherent case for her amendment. And I believe that the mandatory penalty, losing your licence for 12 months, is still proportionate for this new level that we're bringing in. Of course, judicial discretion allows for exceptional circumstances. We took evidence in the Justice Committee on this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and Chief Superintendent Ian Murray was clear in his evidence to us that day. He said lowering or varying the penalty based on the amount of alcohol consumed would actually reduce the deterrent effect. And we shouldn't take account of, in a quote, whether somebody was three times or six times more likely to kill themselves or somebody else. So he was very firm in his view that we should have um, a single um, penalty for this. But getting the message across to every single driver that there is no safe amount you can drink before taking control of a vehicle will arguably require the most extensive driver education campaign ever. And I do have some concerns as to whether this can be achieved in just two and a half weeks. I'm also sympathetic to the Labour's amendment and wonder whether the impact of alcohol in next day drivers needs to be more prominent in the publicity material. I mean, how many people know it can take roughly 13 hours to be alcohol free after drinking four pints of strong lager or ale? And as Dr Rice alluded to in his evidence to the committee, it's still a common misconception that coffee, sleep, a shower, exercise or a full Scottish breakfast will actually speed up the removal of alcohol from, from your system and of course it doesn't. So I support this approach, um, don't drink and drive, but this must be accompanied by sufficient education so that we can reach this zero tolerance approach. Presiding officer, we were able to modify the drink drive limit using the significant powers devolved through the Scotland Act 2012. Steered by Liberal Democrat Secretary of State for Scotland, Mike Moore, it is a testament to our commitment to strengthen the powers of this Parliament. Scottish Liberal Democrats will always support evidence-based efforts to make our roads safer and save lives, and therefore we will back the motion today. Many thanks. <clears throat> I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, drink driving has been a scourge on Scotland's road for too long, uh, leading to completely unnecessary injuries and deaths, uh, devastating families and communities across the country. It is absolutely right that the Scottish Government is taking this decisive action. Around one in ten deaths on Scotland's road involve drivers who are over the limit. And having even one drink, uh, as uh, Alison McInnes said, is enough to make you three times as likely to be involved in a fatal, in a fatal car crash. That's why lowering the blood alcohol limit is the right thing to do making our roads safer, saving lives, and preventing more families from having to deal with losing a loved one through drink driving. This new limit will send out a clear message by driving after you have had one drink, it's unacceptable. And I hope, presenting officer, that the rest of the UK, like other members said, will follow Scotland's example on this important issue and comes into line with the rest of Europe. I agree with Margaret Decker of Scotland's campaign against irresponsible drivers when she stated, to my mind, it's only a start to eradicating the scourge of drink driving in Scotland. Our European neighbours have already introduced the same or even lower limit. Uh, like a lot of uh, Polish people who live here in Scotland, uh, they know that uh, their limit is a lot lower in Poland. It's uh, 20 milligrams. Only Malta and the rest of the UK limit will still be at 80 milligrams after uh, this Parliament passed uh, this bill. For example, the Republic of Ireland lowered its drink drive limit to 50 milligrams in 2011, 
with a further limit of 20 mg introduced for specified drivers, such as those who have recently passed their test. Uh, France, who has a different social attitude with drink driving, has a 50 uh, uh, milligram limit, but with a long tradition of random breath testing. And uh, we uh, went through, uh, we interrogated uh, the panel when we came in front of the committee about uh, breath testing, and the committee was told by Dr. Rice of the Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problems uh, that 15 percent of French drivers are tested every year while the numbers who are tested in the UK are in single figures. So there is a case uh, for uh, random breath testing, and that case uh, was made at committee. Unfortunately, it's another of one of the, of the policies which is still reserved. I remember the numerous road safety campaigns in the French media warning that police would conduct random breath testing on local roads, and that worked very well. I am sympathetic uh, to Margaret Mitchell's amendment, uh, as it reads, not how she explained it uh, in, in, in a speech, because considering that the application and penalties imposed should be proportionate, I can agree with that, but not now, because as we heard at committee, 50 milligram is really uh, uh, what is uh, proportionate, and uh, it's the limit we have just now is the penalties we have just now. I think if we are, li if we are thinking about lowering the limit at one point, I agree with her, I think we will need to have these powers uh, devoted, and that will be uh, uh, of, of benefit to us. Uh, Margaret Decker of Scotland Campaign Against Irresponsible Driver said we would like to see a zero limit. And, you know, a lot of people do ask for a zero limit. I'm not uh, particularly agree on the zero limit, but a lower limit. Other countries have it. Like I said, Poland have got a lower limit. So if we could have all these powers devolved, we might, be, we might consider it. We know that the Scottish Taxi Federation supports zero tolerance as well, uh, because too many people have been victims of drink drivers. The Road Orange Association supports more stringent drink driving regulations. So, presiding officer, I do think there is a case today for having all these limits to be devolved. Lowering the blood alcohol limit is the right thing to do, and I'm looking forward to continue on the road of eradicating the scourge of drink driving in Scotland. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I now call on David Stewart to be followed by Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. And as um, a veteran road safety campaigner, I very much welcome this debate uh, this afternoon. And of course, I'll be supporting the Scottish Government's motion at five o'clock. I will focus um, my remarks, President Officer, on young driver safety. Uh, it's very appropriate, of course, we're having this debate in Road Safety Week. Uh, I'll begin, perhaps, if I could, by reading part of a blog that was posted on a well-known site from the best friend of a drink driver. It states, and I quote, We all enjoy our nights out, but my mate takes it far too far. He's never aggressive or anything like that when he's drunk, but last Friday night was the tipping point for many of us that go out. We found that after 18 pints of Caffrey's, 10 JDs and Cokes and various shots of liqueurs, that he actually drove the three miles home. All that started at 5 p.m. and ended at 4 a.m. This has got to stop. If he'll hit anyone or anything, then he would never have known about it. The blog went on. My take on this, that if he's stupid enough to do it, then he will have to face the consequences. Not just him, but what about, what about his wife, his three children, and God forbid the poor family of the person that he hits, unquote. Presiding officer, after spending years campaigning for driver safety, I think I've learned a lot about the tragedies that are involved in drink driving and spent a lot of time thinking about the solutions to that crucial aspect of driver safety. The trigger for me, presiding officer, was the tragic death of two 17-year-olds in Inverness in March 2010, which was directly linked to drink driving. It's a truism that's not depleted by repetition, that there is no greater tragedy, no greater sorrow, and no greater loss than for a parent to lose a child. The Highland tragedy um, got me to set up a local group called NOSTAT, North of Scotland Driver Awareness Team, that led to local campaigns in the Highlands and Islands called Sensible Driving, Always Arriving. And although drink driving appears to be a single issue, as many members have recognised, it's in fact a diverse problem that includes various dimensions such as alcohol abuse, underage drinking and other social concerns, as identified in the North Review and the NICE report of 2010. Therefore, the solutions need to be equally intricate and wide-ranging, and that demands a comprehensive, creative and flexible approach. It's important to view drink driving in the broader... Con Dave Thompson. 
the member for taking a, an intervention and just wonder, in order to get the full range of um, issues dealt with, does he agree with me that we need to have all of the powers relating to this matter devolved to this parliament? David Stewart. Uh, President, so I certainly welcome the work that the member has done in the case of drink driving and acknowledge the work he's done. And certainly uh, in, the, in this area, as uh, Dr. Ipsha Simpson has mentioned, I think there are strong arguments for having day-to-day um, -day administration over this particular area. So I support the general thrust of the, the member's comments. So it's important to view drink driving in the broader context of public health implications of alcohol abuse. So as a result, the solutions must take into account drinking patterns and groups that are particularly at risk. As in the Highlands and Islands Road Safety, as a Highlands and Islands Road Safety campaigner, I welcome any measures that will improve road safety and reduce fatalities and serious injuries um, as a result. It's a tragedy that every year one in ten deaths on Scottish roads involve a driver who is over the drink driving limit. So every year, on average, there are 30 deaths on Scottish roads that are caused by drivers who are over the legal limit. In 2010, as has already been mentioned, there were 750 casualties and 20 deaths directly as a result of drink driving. In 2011, 680 casualties and 20 deaths directly as a result of alcohol. Of course, I, ha I heartily welcome suggestion to lower the permitted blood alcohol level in Scotland, a power, as other members have mentioned, enabled by the Scotland Act of 2012. And of course, I look forward to the UK government following our lead for the rest of the UK as soon as possible. So I would welcome the speedy introduction of this legislation and again, as other members have, say, have said, we need a clear and an ambiguous message. If you're driving, don't drink. Don't do the lottery with your career. And don't force other road users to do the same, such as pedestrian or cyclists. If you do, you will face the consequences. In conclusion, international best practice suggests that the countries that have the lowest drink driving figures have three things in common. A long track record of drink driving enforcement, a high level of detection, and finally, a mass media support for enforcement. For young drivers in particular, graduated license schemes with restrictions on passengers, night driving, and zero tolerance of alcohol, along with increased education, will reduce the carnage in our roads and cause a reduction in deaths and injuries, particularly among young people throughout Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Christine Graham to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'll address both amendments. So the first one, Graham Pearson, is absolutely fine and dandy. In fact, a great deal of the committee conversation and interrogation of witnesses a week or so ago was about the morning after effects of alcohol, mostly concerned about people being unsure whether or not you know, they'd be caught the next day and, and quite innocently perhaps having been at a wedding and so on. I don't understand Margaret Mitchell's. I'm going to just read it as it would amend the motion so she can clarify in her summing up that the Parliament supports the reduction of the drink drive limit, which will help to save lives and make Scotland's roads safer, considers that the application and penalties imposed should be proportionate. I don't understand it. Does it mean that some people who are stopped, who are over that 50, it shouldn't be applied to them? Or does it also mean that if it's applied to them, they shouldn't have mandatory banning for the year? Well, we can't do that. There is mandatory banning. The 50 is just being substituted for the 80. No, I've only got four minutes. I'm hoping. I want to support your amendment. You'll need to clarify, for goodness sake, what it actually means. Um, I have to say, of course, the committee wholly supported the reduction to 50 milligrams and 100 millilitres. Um, and as I said before, we are concerned not about people in the pub having a drink where they shouldn't and then take the car, but what happens um, the morning after. And as my colleague has stolen my line about the Scottish breakfast, I returned to my own, which was the iron brew and the bacon roll won't do. Uh, and just taking a shower and a cold walk with the dog and so on, you'll still be over the limit. I mean, the evidence we had from medical was in fact your liver is like going through the supermarket checkout you can only go through one at a time so each drink has to go through the liver at a certain rate it doesn't go through faster in any way I hope you can follow the metaphor I did at the time most importantly however to me is information uh, information not just over Christmas because we move into the summer and the spring and, and, and people are out uh, in the sunshine having wine and so on and it's to have in particular 
cross-border, which in my particular area of the Scottish border is very important. And I know you're going to have electronic signs and gantries and motorways and so on. Can I also suggest that at motorway services that you also have them. The Cabinet Secretary is nodding, obviously was ahead of me with that. I'm glad it's an ITV border, a wee plug from there, but we don't get STV in the Scottish border, so it was very important that they were encapsulated in this. However, I'm going to be a little bit controversial, not like my usual style. I am not, I know this isn't devolved, but I am slightly concerned about random testing. Why I'm concerned about it is not that I in any way support people drinking and driving, but random testing kind of strays for me into the area of civil liberties. We've been there with stop and search, and the police said, oh, but most of the stop and search that have done is consensual. Well, if a policeman says, can I search, and you say no, you think you're on shaky ground, you probably just say yes anyway, because you have nothing to hide. I, I don't know. The public say they don't mind random uh, testing, but I don't know if every motorist pulled over for no reason whatsoever who then has the window down and the policeman leans in just to see if he can sniff or she can sniff any alcohol and will be that happy. Um, I think there is a balance here between, you know, taking the public with you and just saying we can stop you in any event. And what was not clear to me, we all know the thing about, hen, your brake light's not functioning when you're asked to stop and the window goes down and you know fine what it's all about. From the police actually saying in evidence, just they can stop us anyway. They can stop us without any cause for concern, either the way you're driving or any condition of your vehicle. I didn't know that was the case. I'd like that clarified. So I just leave that with you, that random testing, yes, everybody says they're in favour of it. If you were to start to do it on a large scale, if we had the power, you might find some of the public just getting a little bit. I know you don't agree with Mr Allard. I told you it'd be controversial, but I think it's worth considering. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Hans Alamalik to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. Speaking on reducing the drink drive limit today is important, and I fully agree with the motion and the Labour Party's amendment. The UK currently has the highest drink drive alcohol limit in the United European Union at 80 milligrams per 100 milliliters of blood. This is clearly evidence that the reduction to 50 milligrams per 100 milliliters will reduce the number of deaths and serious injuries caused by drink driving. Estimates of how many lives can be saved with a lower limit vary, but there is evidence that indicates between three to seven lives could be saved on Scottish roads per annum. The risk of getting into a crash significantly rises once the blood levels reach above 50 milliliters in every 100, uh, sorry, milligrams in 100 milliliters of blood. Although this stri strange evidence has base reducing the drink levels limit on the 5th of December, there is widespread support for extending external organizations such as the British Medical Association and the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents. And these are professionals who deal on a day-to-day -day basis with our ailments and our health services as well as dealing with accidents. The government needs to ensure that proposals are fully resourced so that Police Scotland has the support they need to implement the policy, including resources of evidence, uh, education, educating drivers about the changes in the law, and also in terms of making sure the message gets through. The, file, the Cabinet Secretary has indicated uh, uh, very clearly in the areas that he would be uh, pursuing this, but I also want the Cabinet Secretary to be aware that there are a lot of other communities, uh, particularly youngsters, who could benefit from such education and advice. I personally, mean, uh, I personally am in the favor of reducing the drink drive limit to a much lower level. I appreciate that a zero level may cause problems as certain foods, medication, and perhaps even some mouthwashes can have an impact on breathing tests. But I feel that in the future, re reductions the limit to a normal level, such as a 0 0.5%, uh, if five milligrams per 100 milliliters, would get rid of a lot of confusion about how much one can drink and get behind a vehicle. 
the important fact is loss of life, loss of limb, uh, disruption to family life, it's far too high a price for us to pay for not to secure this sort of levels. It is pure madness to allow it to continue, people in our society to continue to put not only themselves at risk, but many others. I have seen firsthand as a counselor uh, the hardship that families have to go through when someone is either convicted of drink driving because of loss of employment and other amenities, but also victims who have been injured uh, to no fault of their own, uh, and the families have had to pick up the pieces. I think sometimes we, we underestimate the value that we lose uh, when someone is either injured or has lost their life because of this. And I'm also very keen for the Cabinet Secretary to look at one other issue, and that is all those people who use machineries, who are divers, pilots, automobile drivers, train drivers, we need to look at that as well, not just simply car drivers. I hope that you will take this message on board and I look forward to your proposal in the future. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call Richard Lyle to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As already stated, there has been a drink driving limit in place since 1965. And since then, social attitudes towards those who drink drive have changed changed dramatically since the 60s, with most people taking a hard-line stance on the issues surrounding drink driving. I go as far as saying that the people of Scotland in relation to drink driving have developed a strong social conscience towards the issue of drink driving and are clear that drink driving can have devastating effects. Despite this, I am disappointed to note that an estimated 20 lives still continue to be lost in Scotland's roads as a result of drink driving, not to mention all the other serious injuries sustained by members of the public. And that's why I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has decided to lower the drink driving limit. I'm also encouraged by the results of the Scottish Government's consultation, which showed that the vast majority of people who responded would support a lower drink driving limit in Scotland. In fact, just short of 75% of respondents say they would support a lower drink driving limit which I believe reinforces the idea of our nation's conscience on this issue. New drink driving limit in place from the 5th of December will make Scotland's roads safer, as it allows the police, prosecutors and our courts to take more drivers off the road who pose a risk to public safety and will act as a deterrent in encouraging people not to drink and drive at all. Particularly as the new limit is coming into force in the lead up to the festive period, where many may have been tempted to have a drink and drive after an office party or from a family gathering. When I first started driving, I, I, like anyone else, would have a couple of pints. Then I found someone who was stopped one night and those couple of pints had put him over the limit. I then went down to one pint and then I said, why should I? I then said, no, I don't want to be caught. I don't want to drink and drive. I then, now as I take a friends out, I drink orange, and I still enjoy my night. With this in mind, the Scottish Government is doing all it can to ensure that the public is properly informed about the change in the drink driving limit. The campaign was launched, I note, on the 17th of this month, and includes a TV and radio advert across Scotland, and as well a robust social media campaign. With a new drink driving limit in place, it brings Scotland into line with most other European countries. As already has been stated, the Republic of Ireland is an example of good practice as to the benefits of the lower limit. A, a review of their policy published in December 2012 found that the number of arrests for drink driving between October 2011 and October 2012 had fallen when compared with our 2010 statistics which was the last calendar year in which the higher limit was in force. Drivers in the Republic of Ireland have adjusted their behaviour to take into account with the lower limit. This evidence is encouraging, and I would hope to see the same reduction in Scotland. To finish, presiding officer, I would encourage all members to support the lower drink driving limit, as it will make our roads safer and save lives. Even with the lower limit, you're still three times three times more likely to die in a crash if you had taken no alcohol. 
So the best advice we can give, and I'm sure ma many members already have said this, said this give is to have no al alcohol in your, uh, if you plan on driving. I think uh, already uh, also has been stated, remember what you drink the night before is still in your system the next morning. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, President Officer. Reducing the drink drive limit will make Scotland's roads safer. We all know that alcohol affects a driver's judgment and reaction times, and we know that the risk of having a road accident increases as more alcohol is consumed. Yet, we also know that Scotland and the United Kingdom have one of the highest drink drive limits in Europe. In his report for the UK Government in 2010, Sir Peter North recommended the reduction in the drink drive limit from 80 milligrams, 100 millilitres, to 50, bringing us into line with the vast majority of our European neighbours. It is the rejection of that recommendation by the current Government, coupled with the devolution of the power to set a specific limit for Scotland, which has led to this debate. I want to be clear at the outset that I support the reduction in the drink drive limit. I would discourage all forms of drink driving in the strongest possible terms, but I also believe that the Labour's amendment enhances the Government's motion. In his report, Sir Peter North, as the previous member stated, that drivers with a blood alcohol concentration between 20 mg 100 mm and a 50 mg 100 mL have at least three times the greater risk of dying in a road traffic accident than drivers who have no alcohol in their blood at all. The risk of having a fatal accident increases by at least six times with a blood alcohol concentration between 50 and 100 and 80 and 100 and then 11 times between 80 milligrams, 100 millilitres, and 100 milligrams, 100 millilitres. In other words, alcohol increases the risk of a fatal accident exponentially, and there is a significant increase in risk above a blood alcohol concentration of 50 milligram, 100 millilitres. The report notes that there is a case for reducing the limit to 20 milligram, 100 millilitres which Sir Peter argues would be consistent with a clear do not drink and drive policy. However, Sir Peter goes on to explain that only a minority of countries have such a limit and any policy viewed as too restrictive or inflexible could jeopardise the goodwill and public support there is for strengthening drink drive legislation. The BMA have also reminded us that the lowest drink drive limits are the toughest to enforce. There are countries which have a drink drive limit of zero Yet there are circumstances in which people with a medical condition, such as diabetes, or people who use certain mouthwashes, would register alcohol in their blood. The recommendation that we reduce the limit in blood alcohol concentration to 50 to 100 has not only proven to be popular beyond the chamber with the public, the police and road safety campaigners, but it is a practical proposal. It is enforceable and will save lives. There is also a broad agreement that the coming change must be communicated effectively to the public before coming into force on the December the 5th. 32 responses to the Scottish Government's consultation emphasise the need to educate drivers about the change to the drink drive, drink drive limit, and 13 identified the need to educate people about the lingering morning after effects of alcohol. It takes longer than people often think for alcohol to pass through their bodies. People who would never countenance drink driving might not realise how much alcohol remains in their system the morning after a night out. They could find their reaction times are slow, and if they were stopped by police, they could find that they have broken the law. We need to do more than educate drivers, know their limits and know their units. We need to change behaviour and prevent people from getting behind the wheel of a car in the morning when there could still be enough alcohol present in their system to take them over the limit. I would acknowledge a new public awareness campaign launched this week, but I would also appeal to the Government for assurances that attempts to educate motorists will be robust, proactive and will continue beyond the festive uh, season. Presiding officer, with a new drink driving limit, I hope we can prevent needless accidents, injuries and deaths on Scotland's roads. We can make people think more about how much they drink before they drive, and we can send out a clear message that it's safest not to drink at all before getting behind the wheel. With education and enforcement, we can make Scotland's roads safer. 
and I believe we must. Thank you. Many thanks. And the final speaker in the open debate is Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is an important subject, no, no more so than at this time of year. As has been well discussed today, the consequences of drink driving can be dramatic, not only for the individuals involved in accidents, but for those left behind. And as the Cabinet Secretary has already indicated, social attitudes change. And just as a society, we know that taking on board the dire effects of smoking uh, led to a change in public attitudes towards that. So with drink driving, I believe that overwhelmingly the public shared the views of those who participated in the government's consultation. Drink driving not only causes trauma and costs lives, it also causes impacts on an already stretched health service. So along with others today, welcome these proposals. We've heard a lot today about the morning after, and I agree with those who have spoken already that this should be a key theme of public education campaigns, particularly at this time of year. As Chief Superintendent Murray said in evidence to the Justice Committee, 10% of detections in last winter's drink driving campaign were after 6 o'clock in the morning, and we also heard good evidence from Dr Rice. I particularly liked his straightforward comment, quote, that whatever magical properties people endow iron brew, bacon rolls or square sausage with, that is all they are. And basically, time is the only thing that clears alcohol from your system. We all need to apply common sense. If you're out until one in the morning at an office party, don't assume you'll be fit to drive or function by breakfast time. And as others have said, take public transport, or better still, walk. I welcome the general thrust of this legislation. I believe that Scotland does need to be in the mainstream of Europe. Only Malta and England and Wales seem likely to stick to 80, and I particularly note with interest that in Northern Ireland, the new limit is 20 milligrams for uh, learner and novice drivers. And I'm frankly baffled as to why the UK government can agree uh, that kind of provision in Northern Ireland, but not allow the Scottish uh, government and parliament to even consider that prospect. We did, of course, discuss that in evidence. Again, Chief Superintendent Murray took the view that at a certain time, perhaps after holding a licence for two years, then to increase the limit for younger drivers from 20 to 50, for example, would send out the wrong message, whereas Dr Rice suggested that the BMA would favour such an approach. I think the evidence on this is finally balanced, although I think the approach suggested by Margaret Decker of Scotland's campaign against irresponsible drivers to apply a lower limit for professional drivers, such as taxi drivers, school and bus drivers, and anyone who drives in a care capacity, to which uh, Hamzala Malik has already referred, has much to commend it, even though I know it was accepted uh, by her and rejected by the North Review. Where I do agree with the North Review, however, is in seeking to review the impact of a new prescribed limit after five years in relation to young and novice drivers, and at that point to consider again a reduction to 20 for such drivers if the evidence suggested that the anticipated reduction in casualty figures for such drivers had not materialised. On random breath testing, of course, as the Cabinet Secretary indicated in evidence to the Justice Committee, Scotland does not have this power at the present time, even if, if as the Cabinet Secretary indicated, the police would like to have it. And as has been made clear already today, whatever the merits of an approach to disqualification, which allows courts not to automatically disqualify courts convicted of driving at levels uh, between uh, 50 and 80, or for that matter, between 20 and 50, this Parliament currently does not have those powers at all. And at the risk of being accused of raising the constitutional issue again, I think the distinction between uh, limits and penalties is something the public will find it increasingly difficult to understand increasingly difficult to accept that uh, we should be in charge of one but not, with the, not the other. In conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome this measure and would hope that the public education campaign will be a success and that we can look forward to reduction in road casualties this Christmas. That will be a Christmas worth having. Thank you, presiding officer. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Alex Johnston. Maximum five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Anyone who's familiar with the works of Robert Burns, particularly Tam Shanter, will know about the difficulties in managing your transport after you've had a skin full. Uh, however, the, the issue of taking a horse home uh, is one which uh, historically has happened much more recently in Scotland, where it was quite often the tradition that a farmer would go off to the mart drink heavily after the end, at the end of the day's work and then somebody would tip him into his gig and his pony would take him home because the pony knew the way. 
The tradition uh, seems to dictate that uh, these kind of things had happened, but uh, perhaps it was the driverless car before such a thing had actually been invented. Attitudes have changed, uh, and motor vehicles have made it a much more important thing for us to address. Uh, and, of course, drinking and driving to excess has been illegal since 1967. But I think the message we all need to be prepared to get out now is that it is not acceptable to drink any amount of alcohol before driving. The reason why we need a defined limit is so that we can then uh, identify easily those who have crossed it and prosecute them effectively. However, there have been a number of issues thrown up during this discussion and concerns over the effect of those who have drunk the night before and who may be surprised to discover that they are still uh, under the influence the following day is something that will require significant levels of education and urgently if the limit is to be introduced for the 5th of December. And that's why we on this side of the chamber will happily support that and the other reasons behind the, uh, the Labour Party's amendment. Turning to the Conservative Party amendment, we were very pleased at the way uh, the reaction we got from Kenny McCaskill at the start of this debate. The objective of the Conservative Party amendment is to introduce the idea that at some point in the future it may be possible, perhaps even necessary, to consider variable application of penalties. Look, if we look at the situation we find ourselves in uh, with this legislation, simply taking the penalties currently applied to 80 and applying them to 50 is all well and good. But there is an argument that says we should consider for the future whether those who are over 80 or over some other level should be penalised to a greater level. Similarly, we have spoken today about the possibility of new powers allowing us to consider uh, lower limits or different limits for different people uh, at a lower end of the scale. I think it would be reasonable then also to have us uh, have a, a good understanding in advance about the possibilities of variable penalties at that end of the scale also. But what we need to do, and what we need to do urgently, is understand what it is we are trying to achieve. We must enforce uh, the, the drink driving limit effectively, and it is possible to enforce that 50 milligram limit. But we must educate people to understand that they should not be drinking and driving. But at the end of the day, we have a number of comments that have been made here that tell us what the real problem is. The minister himself spoke about a persistent minority who continue to drink and drive. We heard David Stewart talking about an individual who, I think in a blog, claimed to have driven after drunk drinking 18 pints. Well, the reduction of the limit from 80 to 50 will not affect individuals of that kind. So we have a challenge in front of us. We have the opportunity to encourage people to take a much more responsible attitude. We need to ensure that when it comes to enforcement, we do have a proper uh, attitude towards enforcement and that the resources are made available to ensure that we have fair uh, and effective enforcement. If we look at the experience that we've had in the past, the Minister's statement that we want fewer drink drivers, not more convictions, is one that I would like to give my backing to also. But it does contradict the experience, perhaps at some times in the past, when the practices involved in, con in uh, policing speed on our roads, for example, have led to a, an, an emphasis on catching those who are easiest to catch most likely to admit their guilt and accept their penalties, while some others have tended to be treated less severely in terms of enforcement. The members just closing. It, it, it is very important that we understand that going forward with this change will save lives, but it will raise questions. We must enforce effectively, we must educate effectively, and we must ensure that resources are properly targeted to make the maximum effect of this change in the law. You must For close, that please. reason, uh, we will be supporting uh, the amendments and the motion at five o'clock. Thank you very much. And I call on Elaine Murray. Seven minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I start by commending both uh, David Thompson and David Stewart for the amount of work that they have done uh, on road safety over the years. Uh, prior to the Road Safety Act of 1967, it was a crime to be in charge of a car while unfit to drive through 
drink or drugs, but there was no reliable test for measuring when a driver was unfit. In fact, it had been an offence to be drunk in charge of carriages, horses, cattle and steam engines since 1872. And I'm actually old enough to remember, uh, I didn't drive at the time, uh, when the Transport Minister in Hal Wilson's government, Barbara Castle, introduced the breathalyser to considerable public, public outcry at the time. In fact, I can remember a Christmas episode of Steptoe and Son where Harold was breathalysed whilst drunk in charge of Hercules and then uh, poured a probium onto uh, the Transport Minister for having introduced this breathalyser. I certainly hope that there is no such public reaction to Mr McCaskill or indeed to the Parliament for us uh, passing this legislation. Uh, the combination of the introduction of the first approved uh, breathalyser and a government-run ca advertising campaign reduced the number of road traffic accidents where alcohol was involved in the United Kingdom from 25% to 15% of the, the, the first year of that coming in uh, and uh, a reduction of, in deaths of 1,152 which shows how bad it was at that time but indeed how legislation uh, could make a good effect. Uh, now the latest statistics I think indicate in 2011 uh, that 230 people died in alcohol related accidents but that of course is 230 people across the United K Kingdom, 230 people too many. And as the Cabinet Secretary says, public attitudes to drink driving have changed. Driving after having drunk alcohol uh, was, prior to the 1967 Act, fairly normal practice. And indeed, the limits in the Act actually appear to condone driving after moderate drinking. Uh, it still is, for the time being, possible to go to the pub for an evening, drink a couple of pints, and Richard Lyle uh, uh, referred to this, and still not be over the le legal limit. But that must no longer be the message that we put out. Fifty years on from the first adverts proclaiming the hazards of drink driving, it is timely that the, re the limit is reconsidered. The UK may have well have been ahead of other countries in 1967, but as others have said, we are now behind the limit in the majority of European countries. It is now 50 milligrams per 100 millimetres, and indeed in some it is 20. We agree that it's time Scotland caught up. Uh, it was the UK Transport Minister, Lord Adonis, who commissioned Sir Peter North's uh, review, which both uh, Richard Simpson and Margaret McCulloch referred to, uh, to consider the case for changing the drink driving limit in the United Kingdom. He concluded that it should be 50 milligrams. Uh, his evidence suggested, as others have said, an accident involving a driver with 80 milligrams alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood uh, was six times more likely to result in death than a driver who had no alcohol. It's curious, I think, that the current UK government refused to act on Lord North's <laughs> recommendations, but I'm pleased at the uh, devolution of power uh, to alter the drinking driving limit to, in the Scotland Act of 2012 has given this Parliament, once again, I think, the power to take the lead in the United Kingdom, as we did on the banners and, in, on smoking in public places, and bring that limit down to 50. Instead of the current uh, situation where uh, driving after consuming a small amount of alcohol is permissible, the message now has to be, do not drink at all if you intend to drive. Now, many of drivers already take this approach. I've spoken to my own three children who are all adults and drive, wouldn't even dream of having a drink uh, before they were driving. And I think we, we want to encourage that to be normal. Educating drivers about the changes, of course, is vital and also needs, as our motion says, to make drivers aware of next day effects. Uh, and this is an opportunity, I think, to remind drivers that they must all also remember that alcohol could still be the, in their system the, the day after uh, dr drinking. And as uh, others have said, people have various uh, remedies for having drinking, including drinking um, fizzy drinks made from iron girders. Uh, but none of these things actually work, as various people have said. Um, and it's particularly important at this time of year when festive night, out, nights out might involve heavier drinking than normal or late night or early morning drinking work mics going to the pub and then on to meals or nightclubs. Drunk, drivers need to think about what they've consumed uh, and when before they take the car out the following day. Um, I, as you can see, I'm a fairly small female. I weigh about 50 kilograms. Uh, and I did an experiment with my partner, who's a lot bigger than me. We bought a breathalyzer and we actually, we did this in the safety of our own home. I had a, a monitor, I monitored how quickly your blood alcohol concentrations go up and come back down again. And somebody my size will go up faster, and you'll also stop drinking sooner, slow down sooner because it's going up faster, but you process it at the same level and it gets out of your system faster. And there is a lesson out there for larger people that you may be able to drink more, but it'll stay in your system to long. So be careful the next day that you may not, you may feel fine, but you may not actually be uh, capable of driving. We feel actually that, mess, that lesson needs to get out to people that however good you feel, you may not have a hangover, you may feel fine, but you may not actually be capable of driving. And people need to think, particularly at this time of year, people need to think about that. Now, the, 
I have difficulty and I cannot support the Conservative motion because I think its interpretation is difficult. By referring to penalties and applications being proportionate, it sounds a bit as if you're saying that the way in which people are, the Sheriff's Act, the way in which the Police Scotland Act should be proportionate to the amount that you've had to drink. And it could suggest that a more lenient attitude should be taken by Police Scotland and by sheriffs uh, for people who are between the 50 and 80 milligram limit. I think that muddies the water. I think if we, we will, if the government chooses to support that amendment, we certainly won't vote against the amended motion. But I think it puts a mixed message out there that somehow there is some proportionate response which leads on from the fact that we've brought the drink driving limit down. I think we have to be clear, we mustn't dilute the message uh, which this legislation is intended to convey, that it is not safe to drink and drive. If you are dr uh, driving, do not drink anything at all. If you have been drinking the night before, particularly at this time of year when you're drinking, people are drinking more and drinking later, think about what you have had to drink. Think about whether you could still be over the limit the next day. And if there's any chance you could be over the limit the next day, don't go out and drive. There are machines that you can buy, as I've said, which test your alcohol. If you think there's any chance uh, that you could be over the limit, you should be actually testing yourself. Or you could be anything over low, in fact. You should be testing yourself and, 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 and not driving if, if there is any alcohol in your system whatsoever. If we actually to improve this, the road safety uh, record of this country further, we actually need to t t take that very seriously. And we need to get that lesson out to the public. And now, the, the days of drinking or driving or driving with alcohol in your system are no more. Many thanks. I now call on Kenny McCaskill to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until 5pm. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been a remarkably consensual uh, debate in the main. We would expect no less when we're talking about people's lives that have been lost and lives that we seek to save. Uh, for that reason, and Notwithstanding the points made by Lane Murray, I think we accept the spirit of the amendment being made by the Tories. There is a clear uh, I think, assurance being given by us as a government that while we seek the devolution of more powers, I am prepared to consider points I will mention raised both by Hamzala Marek, by uh, uh, Richard Simpson and many others around the table. Uh, we see no basis on which you could ever vary uh, from a mandatory period of disqualification of one year and indeed greater uh, for subsequent uh, offences and indeed depending upon the particular circumstances circumstances, even for a first offence, when we reduce from 80 to 50. But I think we accept the spirit of what was put forward as an amendment by the Labour Party, and we fully agree that there has to be an information campaign, and I hope to be able to give the assurance that that can be done, and equally uh, that perhaps we do have to have uh, further focus, and we would welcome that. It is a position I think almost every speaker has mentioned. By all means. Stuart Maxwell. I, I, I'm still somewhat confused because I, I know what the Cabinet Secretary say, has just said and what he said in his opening speech about the Conservative amendment. But neither speaker from the Conservative Party could properly explain their amendment. I mean, I've read the amendment again just to make sure I'm not making a mistake. But it does seem to talk about import, penalties imposed should be proportionate. And they, uh, neither speaker could actually say clearly what that meant. And I am still very concerned about the implications of the Conservative amendment. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I have to say I am satisfied that our judiciary do impose proportionate sentences. If on any occasion it is felt that it is disproportionate, then we have an appellate court and ultimately we also have uh, the uh, Scottish uh, Criminal Case Review Commission that very rarely would be invoked, I think, for a drink driving offence. But as I say, I am happy to accept the spirit, even if uh, perhaps sometimes some of the comments made by the Conservatives regarding the attitudes and actions of the police I felt were rather begrudging. Uh, can I say, first of all, that I clearly it is, I think, about saving lives. Significant progress has been made, and Scotland is a safer place on our roads for a variety of factors uh, that have been brought in from governments north and south, attitudes that have changed. But it is important to remember that it is not just simply saving those lives that are lost on the road uh, from those who are driving and cause the death of themselves, uh, or indeed their passenger, or indeed other road users who are minding their own business. The last road traffic Christmas awareness campaign last year, as I recall, we did so with a woman who had lost her husband, accompanied by her children who had seen their father slain when a driver slew across the road. He was a pedestrian. He wasn't on the road. He was walking home after a night out, having minded his own business, and a driver under the impairment of alcohol lost control and cost him his life made her a widow 
and cause those children to lose their father. So this is about saving the lives, not just of those on the road, but pedestrians who also frequently suffer. Attitudes, and it was mentioned by Graham Pearson quite correctly, and indeed Richard Lyle, I recall, attitudes have changed, understandably and appropriately. I think I can look back at friends and perhaps even my own attitude that's correctly firmed up and changed over the years. But it's not just attitudes that have changed. Roads have changed significantly since 1967. Traffic is significantly heavier. The consequence for a moment's inaction and attention can be much, much greater now than perhaps all those years ago. The power and capacity of vehicles is significantly greater. Having changed my vehicle and still having a vehicle with a 1,200cc capacity, the power, the speed, the acceleration in this car that I have in 2014 is significantly faster and greater than an engine of a much greater capacity all those years ago. So the world has changed and we need to change with it. I can give Margaret uh, Mitchell the assurance the police will provide the same resources. I don't believe and I don't know of any officer who goes around seeking, as I say, to get up targets or lists. I know officers who have been traumatised themselves and who take, and I don't know a police officer who doesn't take drink driving most seriously because they see the consequences. They have to report the bad news to the families. They're aware more than anybody of the action that has to be taken. But I do accept that we actually have to and should go further. Ireland lowered its limits, and this is the point I think many have made on all sides of the chamber. But can I say when Ireland lowered its limit, not simply from 80 milligrams to 50 milligrams, they also had a further limit of 20 milligrams of alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood for specified drivers, and this is the point even Dave Stewart was making, learner drivers, those who have recently passed their test and those driving in a professional capacity, e.g. bus or truck drivers. We live in a Scotland where a train driver, a ferry operator and indeed a plane a pilot operates under a 35 limit. They are not, as I say, regulated by this government, the reserve to Westminster. The only power that we have is the power to lower the drink driving limit and that is what we have done. Had we and will we get other powers, then we will look to replicate what has happened in Ireland. Because let's look at Ireland. The Road Safety Authority in the Republic of Ireland undertook a review of the lower drink driving limits the following year, which found that notwithstanding the lower drink driving limits that were introduced in October 2011, the total number of arrests for drink driving fell slightly. I think because of the point correctly made by Elaine Murray that the campaign hammered home the message that people should not risk it. But the Chief Executive of the Road Safety Authority, Noel Brett, commented, and I quote, since 2007, the number of drivers being detected driving under the influence of alcohol has more than halved. Clearly, the introduction of random breath testing in July 2006 and the lowering of the drink driving limits in October of 2011 have been the principal factors behind this drop. We don't have the ability to have graduated or indeed the 20 to 50 limit that they have, and we don't have random breath testing. I think the difference in the point I would make to, uh, uh, to Christine Graham is that the police can stop any car, but they cannot randomly breath test unless they have a suspicion of alcohol being consumed, which is why the window is there. It may be a moot or tautological point, but I do think random breath testing has a place. It certainly worked in the Republic of Ireland, and it's something I think that this Parliament should have the powers, whether it wish to consider, but it certainly should have the powers to bring it in if it should wish to invoke it. So the experience of the Republic of Ireland is that people got the message that they should not drink and drive, that you couldn't, as was mentioned by Richard Ryle, maybe two, but then we also get others who will go out to a Christmas party or whatever and will think that, well, if they stay for the meal, they can have a glass of wine. If they stay for the dance, then maybe they can have another pint or whatever it is, and lo and behold, they get in the car. There is an appropriate point about what the situation is in the morning after, but I think that's something over recent years the police have been driving home because there was a time, I think, when nobody gave any consideration to what the situation would be in the following morning. Now, I think, over recent years, we've been driving home that message. If you're out, whether it's a Christmas party or any other time of the year, then the situation should be 
uh, that you make alternative arrangements the following day. So I think, presiding officer, I can give members the assurance that we do have an appropriate advertising campaign that will run on beyond the Christmas Hugmanay period. We are going to make sure that those who are contemplating driving the following day take on board the responsibility that they have to be aware of their responsibilities behind the wheel of a vehicle. And on that basis, I simply end, as I start, by paying tribute to Dave Thompson. Some people in this Parliament have the privilege of bringing in a Member's Bill. Because this was reserved, we have not been able to do it because it has been dealt with by subordinate legislation. But this is a political equivalent of a private Member's Bill brought in by Dave Thompson who has campaigned ceaselessly since he came into this Parliament uh, to lower the drink driving limit, he has made Scotland a safer place. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on lowering the drink drive limit. We now move to the next item on business, which is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11549 on approval of the Road Traffic Act 1988, prescribed limit, Scotland Regulations 2014 draft. Formally moved. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 11567.1 in the name of Graham Pearson, which seeks to amend motion number 11567 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on lowering the drink drive limit be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11567.2 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, which seeks to amend motion number 11567 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on lowering the drink drive limit be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11567.2 in the name of Margaret Mitchell is as follows. Yes, 70. No, 37. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11567 in the name of Ken McCaskill as amended on lowering the drink drive limit be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11549 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. <laughs>